Good morning, church. I want to start off by saying a massive thank you to our pastor, Graham, and um, the elders. Thank you so much for the opportunity to to serve the saints this morning through the word. Um, I don't take it for granted. Um, It's a a great privilege, and I'm humbled. Um, And yeah, good to be here. Praise God. God gets the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So as, as Graham said, I'll be continuing our series on breaking the Bible, breaking down the Bible, um, and I'll be focusing on 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Um, I need to start with a warning, if that's okay, uh, purely because reading 1 and 2 Samuel, I think it's difficult to read it without without being challenged and provoked. Um, And there might be some arrows coming your way today. (laughs) Different fires, different shots coming. Um, It's not intentional. I'm not singling anyone out. Um, A lot of it will be coming my way, to be honest, (laughs) coming about my direction. But um, just to let you know, we're not safe. but we thank God. It's, it's, it's a much needed message. Um, hard to hear, but I think it's needed. And we thank God. The Bible says that the Old Testament, the Old Testament was written for our learning, uh, our admonition, so that we can grow. Um, and I pray that as we go through this today, that we are challenged, provoked onto godliness, to live the lives that God has called us to live. So, looking at First and Second Samuel, there's a theme that I consistently saw, which is pride. Everyone say pride. pride. Say it with a bit of pride. 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 <laughs> All right. Um, pride. And a scripture comes to mind, which is why the theme, the topic of this particular message is pride comes before a fall. Say this with me. Pride comes comes before a fall. fall. And that comes from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. It says, Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. Another version says a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goes before a fall. I want to start off with the definition of pride. Please feel free to shout out. When you think of pride, what comes to your mind? What's pride? Thinking you're better. better. Anyone else want to shout out? Arrogance. Arrogance. Okay. Control. Someone said something else. Do you know who I am? <laughs> That's the epitome of it, right? Pride. I'm going to read, um, before I read that actually, I think it's worth looking at the root word. When we look at Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, the word pride there and the, epi- the, the etymology of it, so the root word of it, all right, comes from the Hebrew word gaon. Now, you don't need to worry about what that means, right? But it's worth stressing the fact that gaon relates to swelling, like swelling, rising, like a sea that Nigerians might relate to puff puff, right? (laughs) Swelling, right? Swelling, okay? And that's essentially what it starts from. So essentially, almost like self-importance. I'm going to read from the Oxford English Dictionary. Pride. Oxford Dictionary. It's going to come up, come up on the screen, hopefully. Um, yep. It says, pride refers to a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements, the achievements of one's close associates, or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired. It can also indicate an excessive belief in one's own abilities or superiority, often leading to arrogance. 
pride. Reminds me of the scripture in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, which says that we should be careful to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. It doesn't say we shouldn't think high of ourselves because there might be some arguments about that. But it says don't think of yourself more highly than we ought to think. There is a concept in psychology, a psychological term or concept called the overconfidence effect or bias. And that's the illusion that makes a person believe they are more competent or moral than they truly are. For example, if you ask someone, we tend to go evangelism about once a month, um, a few of us in the church, and feel free to join us if you, if you feel led to. And usually when you ask people, do you think you're a good person? They say, yeah, I'm a good person. If you ask someone who is, if you go to prisons, ask them, do you think you're a good person? They'll find a way to say, yeah, I'm a good person. Yeah, I might have, you know, killed someone, but I'm not a rapist. They'll find a reason to say, I'm a good person. Yeah. Ask a rapist, like, well, you know, it's just, that's the way I was born. And, you know, I just, yeah, at least I'm not killing people. I'm a good person. We tend to find a way to justify ourselves. This is the reason why when people are gambling, there's this illusion that if I can do it, just one more, one more bit, one more bit, one more bit. If I can do it, I've got this. Yeah, that's fine. All right? I can do it. It's this overconfidence. This is why we find it hard to say sorry to people. Have you ever found yourself in a position where you thought you were 100% right? Yeah, I'm very right. Confident. And then you look back and like, wow, <laughs> I was way off the mark. <laughs> All right? That's me sometimes. To my wife, sorry. Sorry, babe. <laughs> I look back and think, why was I saying that? <laughs> what was I thinking that? Overconfidence. In that moment, I am right. Pride. I'll share a personal story. About 10 years ago in my Christian journey, um, yeah, I got involved in ministry quite early, right? In university, like even in college. Um, and I was known to be, you know, this, you know, Jesus guy, okay? And it got to a point. So about 10 years ago, I found myself with the wrong group of people. And without realizing, I started to let lust creep in. I started to dance with the devil, essentially, right? And I started to feel, oh, it's okay. I'll just, you know, speak to her. Oh, yeah, it's okay. And I started to just dabble in things that I wouldn't normally do without realizing. And people would ask me at that point, how's your relationship with God? Oh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah awesome. You know, God is good. I felt like, yeah, me and God are good. But I look back now, I'm like, I was carnal. I was, but in that moment, I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm good. Overconfidence effect. Pride. How does that relate with First Samuel and Second Samuel. So today, I'm going to be going through three major characters in this book. And that's Samuel, Saul, and I want to guess the third person? David. David. <laughs> All right. Let's go through it. So, Samuel's story, very popular. Hannah was his mum. He was born, but before Samuel was born, Hannah struggled to have a baby. So she made a covenant. She said to God, I'm going to dedicate my son to you if I have a child. She had a child. So Samuel was dedicated to the Lord under the mentorship and guidance of a, another prophet, Eli, which is another key character I'm going to go into. Eli was the prophet, the person in place of Samuel, essentially, before Samuel came on the scene, God was not happy with Eli. In fact, Samuel came on the scene because God replaced Eli with Samuel. 
He wasn't happy with Eli. Eli wasn't honorable. He didn't respect or essentially he allowed his children to dishonor God without rebuking them. He was a priest. His children also served. um, And they would just disrespect the house of God. They would disrespect the way things were meant to be done. They would sleep around with, you know, the people that were serving in the tabernacle and so on and so forth. And this guy did nothing. God was not happy with Eli. So he replaced Eli with Sammy. I want to say a little thing about Eli. We don't really see much that Eli did wrong, but we see that God wasn't happy with Eli because of his parenting. I want to charge parents in the room today, right? It's possible that your freedom, as you may call it, or liberality with your children may be hurtful to the children, hurtful to their relationship with God later on. And we see that God wasn't happy with this guy. Let's talk more about Samuel. So Samuel gets to a point where God wants to speak to him. And this is a popular story. Samuel was sitting down one night, okay? And he hears a voice that calls his name. And he gets up. Who's who's calling me? Eli, is that you? Because he was serving with Eli, right? Living in the same place. Was that you? He's like, no, it wasn't me. Um, heard a voice again. Eli, was that you? He said, no, it wasn't me. And again, he comes again. Eli then said, when you hear that voice again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I think there's a lesson to be learned there. God wasn't happy with Eli. However, God used Eli to help Samuel hear from God. That's very interesting. God could use any other way to introduce himself to Samuel, but he chose to use the very man that was immoral. Very interesting. He spoke in many ways to people beforehand. Moses, right? Several people God spoke to Abraham directly. But why did God use Eli to get him to understand that this is God speaking? We're in a generation where people are so quick to label men of God. So quick to say this person is false. This person is, oh, this person, oh, this person is. And they're so so quick to vilify ministers because of moral failures and so on and so forth. But God was still able to use that same guy. So just because the person that happens to be your leader may be someone that you happen to be under their leadership is morally um, questionable in certain areas doesn't mean that God can't use them. And we see that with Samuel. Then Samuel gets accustomed to hearing from God. Um, And it's also interesting. That Samuel, when he heard from God, God didn't speak and share the message until he was ready to listen, until he had his attention. Could it be that some of us today, the reason why we're not having God's guidance and, and his voice clear in our lives, because we're not truly paying attention? Could it be? Could it be that our pride is in the way? that we're so busy doing our own thing and God wants to speak to us and lead and guide us, but we're not ready to listen. So Samuel hears from God and he walks in that direction. Great prophet, great judge. He becomes a judge. So we've gone through the book of Judges. So Samuel is a prophet and also a judge for Israel. His children also became judges. But guess what? 
Samuel's children were not good either. Samuel's children were similar to Eli's children. Both men of God have children, but yet the children are nothing to write home about. This is why we should pray for the children of ministers, children of, you know, pastors. Parenting itself is difficult, but the devil is after the souls of men. Pray. Let's pray for people who are called to ministry and, you know, they are doing ministry frontline and they have children. That they will go in the way of the Lord, that they will not miss their path because the devil is after their souls. So Samuel gets to a point where the people of Israel come to Samuel one day and they say, Samuel, we don't like your sons. They're not good. They're not good judges. We want a king. We want a king. And guess what they said? They said, we want a king like the other nations. Let's look at it. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4 to 7. Scripture is going to come up. It says here, um, that's NLT. It says, Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with this request and went to the Lord for guidance. And God said, Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied. For they are rejected me and not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. God was their king. But they wanted a king. They looked at other nations and like, yeah, they have a king. Human king. We should have a king too. One of the barriers sometimes of a Christian walk is what we see with other people. It's why social media is so powerful. We look at people posting things and we're like, ah. Oh, I wish I was doing that. Oh, I wish I was in Dubai like she's living in Dubai. Has God told you to go to Dubai? No. (laughs) This is what we're talking about. Oh, they have a king. Let's have a king too. That's so dangerous. One of the enemies of walking in God's will is comparing ourselves to other people. So we see these people ask for a king. And God said, okay. He warns them, this is what a king is going to do to you. Not going to treat you fairly. He said, no, it'll be okay. We'll go for a king anyway. And uh, and Samuel goes and anoints a king. The first king of Israel was Saul. Saul. Samuel anoints him. And I'm going to go to the story of Saul soon. But Saul, (sighs) yeah. He was humble eventually, and later on, he became prideful, and then he died. Samuel anointed the second king, which is David. Before I go into the stories of Saul and David, I wanted to just pay attention to to how Samuel anointed David. So Samuel, a man of God, comes to the house of Jesse. Because God says the king is going to come from this house. And he's about to anoint the king, right? He's looking at the sons. Jesse brings up the sons. He looks at the first guy. It was like, wow, this is the king. He's big. He's tall, right? Strong. It's like, this guy looks like a king. Why does he think that? Because Saul looks that way. Saul was tall. He was broad. He was strong. Samuel had that mindset. It's like, yeah, I'm a man of God, but this guy looks like the king. There's a lesson to be learned there. Our experience can get in the way of understanding the will of God. Just because we've done things a certain way doesn't mean that's what God wants to do now. So he sees this guy and says, this guy's going to be the king. But God said, no, I have rejected him. So many lessons. And then eventually he anoints David. But we'll come back to the story of David. Let's move on to the story of Saul. 
Many people remember, when they think of Saul, it's usually an evil person. But Saul initially was a humble guy. When he was told he was going to be king, Saul said, me? Like, my family, like, my clan is, like, the least. And I'm from the tribe that's the least. Like, why are you choosing me? Humble, right? But we see Saul. Eventually, this humble guy settles into being a king. He wins victories after victories. He's like, oh, okay. Uh, maybe I'm a king after all, right? Um, he wins victories after victories. He got used to winning. So used to winning that he forgot that winning wasn't by strength. Wasn't by physical strength. He forgot that. And that could be the case for some of us. So used to winning that we don't realize <laughs> my life belongs to God. Yeah. He holds my life. You know, there's certain churches that get so focused on logistics that they don't even remember to pray anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, yeah, we have effective media team, marketing team. We have this and that. Oh, church is going to be big. They forget the spiritual side of things. So Saul, it's like, yeah, I'm used to winning. To the point where he was shocked. He was cornered. Right? In this particular battle he was about to have. People were leaving him, were scared. He was like, what's going on? And then he did, this is the first time it's visible that pride had entered Saul. What he did was that he did something that no one else as a king should do. The job of a priest was to sacrifice. Saul said, oh, Samuel's late. He's not, he's not on time. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to do the sacrifice myself. I'm the man. And he sacrificed himself. Not himself, but he sacrificed. He did the sacrifice. <laughs> he wouldn't sacrifice himself. <laughs> right? Pride. Pride. So, Samuel comes, and he was furious. God wasn't happy with this. And from then on, God started to look for a new king. Because he saw pride had entered. Hmm. Second time, this is where it really got to it. There was a time when Saul was going for a battle, similar situation, okay, he won the battle this time, and he was instructed beforehand that do not take anything from the goods from the people that you defeat. Yeah. Um, but Saul took a few things. Samuel came to him and said, why did you do that? And Saul said, well, we just took a few things. We were going to use it to sacrifice to God to thank him. And God said, don't take anything. But he said, yeah, we're just going to take a few things, and we're really going to sacrifice it anyway. And this is where the famous saying comes, obedience is better than sacrifice. There's a big lesson there. I once heard a man of God talk about this particular story. And he said, Saul reminds us of people who use the things of God to justify their selfishness. He wanted to keep a few things. But he said, oh, it's, it's just a sacrifice. Sounds nice, godly. It could be that the desire you think you have is coming from a place of pride, not from the will of God. You hear some people say, I want to have a lot of money to sponsor the gospel. <laughs> I want to be rich, but to give to the poor. But God knows your heart. Amen. God knows. So Saul lets pride kick in. So much so that he allowed the devil to take over him. The Bible said that Saul became possessed by a devil, by a demon. Let's look at the scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14 to 16. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord left Saul, 
And the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. You might be thinking, why did the Lord send that? If you look at the next verse, um, it says, Let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. Okay? Um, Another version says, when the tormenting spirit from the Lord troubles you. In other words, the people saw that and said, this is from God. Right? Um, this evil spirit. Now, there is, I'm going to go into a little bit la- um, later on, but there is a case where God allows the, the devil to have its way because you have entertained it. Pride. So the devil begins to torment Saul. And it's so clear that the devil is tormenting Saul because he tried to kill David so many times and apologized as well, every single time. He said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm a bad man, you're a good man. Did it again and again. Yeah. That's how you know. There's demons dealing with this guy. Let's move on. Let's talk about the man David. Let's talk about the man David. David was, uh, before we actually go into David, I think it's worth also stressing the idea that when Saul was trying to kill David so many times, um, it's so clear that this guy tried over and over again that there is a demon behind this that is troubling, is troubling this guy and he just felt the need to keep on chasing him. The reason why I'm saying this is because, is because There's certain people that could be in our lives, maybe at work or wherever, that are on your case against you that are really not knowing that it's a demon, a devil, like literally influencing them to do that. This world is spiritual. This world is spiritual. And we're going to go through a few things later on as well. But um, let's look at David. David, again, humble guy, was the least chosen um, he was forgotten when Samuel came around. Completely forgotten. And then God remembered him. So David was chosen, anointed to be king. Um, David boasted in God. When it came to the famous story of Goliath, David and Goliath, um, David sees this situation and he was confident about God's power. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Uncircumcised. So confident in God's power. And this is the same confidence God wants us to have. The Bible says that we are circumcised by the Spirit. Um, And this is the circumcision that gives us confidence that we have overcome. Amen? Amen. There's an interesting story of Jonathan and David. Great friendship. Great friendship. But we see a story of someone who sacrificed his opportunity to be a king when Saul didn't do the same thing. In John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? He gave. But true love is sacrifice. That's why 1 John 3.16 says that we should lay our lives down for the brethren too. We are called to sacrifice. So we see David. David was a man after God's own heart. Every time David was going out to battle, he would ask God, what do you want? What would you have me do? How would you lead me? Should I go? Should I pursue? And God would say, go. And he would go. If God said no, he would would say no. It was after God's heart. Can we do the same thing? Every time you're about to make a decision and move, maybe go somewhere. And sometimes you're so quick to say, oh, I'm going to buy a house here. I'm going to do this there without asking God for direction. Does God want you to do that? This job, does God want you to, to, to go in that direction? It might be little things that we think that we own our lives. Check with our Father. Check with God. So we see David 
winning several victories, several victories. But we see at a particular point, this man that was after God's own heart, he gets to a point where he became king, officially established as king. Let's read the scripture. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 10 to 13 says, And David became more and more powerful because the Lord God of heaven's armies was with him. The king Hiram of Tyre sent messengers to David along with cedar timber and carpenters and stone masons, and they built David a palace. This is the next scripture that's worth paying attention to. And David realized that the Lord had confirmed him king over Israel and has blessed his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. Key word there is he realized, it dawned on David, I am actually king. And guess what happens next? After moving from Hebron to Jerusalem, David married more concubines and wives and they had more sons and daughters. Wow. He realized. We see later on, I think the next chapter or the chapter after that, that's when David decides, oh, that lady bathing over there, <laughs> she looks good. Bring her, to, bring her to me. So he commits a big sin, big fall, sleeps with a person's wife, kills the man, hides it. Shame. Where did that come from? David realized. I'm the man. Pride. Pride kicked him. Why did that happen? This guy was a good guy. But pride kicked him. But you probably ask David, you probably say, I'm, I'm, I'm good. My relationship with God is good. But pride had kicked him. Had kicked him. Sometimes we don't realize things that we are going through. We don't realize we're at a point where we've allowed pride to come in. To the point where it becomes destructive. A well-known uh, evangelical apologist, Zach, Ravi Zacharias. This man was amazing, gracious, knowledgeable, fought and defended the faith. Everyone loved him. Great guy. How did such a man get to a point where he started to deal with sexual immorality? How? We don't know. But we know pride is evil. Pride. This is a call to search our hearts. This is a call to search our hearts. And we don't know this. Maybe before you used to, like, um, you know, before you got a job, you used to pray every single time. Pray and fast, come to church. Everything was nice in your relationship with God. Now you got a job. They're like, oh, I can't come to church. I'll come to church once a month. You know, oh, I can't pray today. And we don't even realize that this is what's going on in our hearts. Pride begins to kick in. Pride. Pride. But in all of this, God is still good. God is still good. You know, he wasn't surprised the situation with Eli he wasn't surprised um, when he sent Samuel around then God said in 1 Samuel 2 verse 35 it's going to come up 1 Samuel 2 verse 35 I believe God said I will raise up myself a faithful priest and he will do according to what is in my heart and mind. And you can read that and think it's talking about Samuel, but that's talking about Jesus Christ. It's talking about Jesus Christ. That's the bigger picture. God was not surprised by all of this. In fact, David wanted to build a place for God. He said, um, you know, this, I, don't, I can't stay in this place and God not, not have a temple. I want to build God a temple. God said, I don't need a place to stay. He said, I will build you a temple. 
Oh, when I read that, I felt like screaming. I will build you a temple. God is not caught by surprise. He had a big plan centered around Christ. The whole Bible, as, as Graham taught us, meta narrative is centered around Jesus Christ. God had a plan all along. Even through the failings of these people, God had a plan. And guess what? The same Bathsheba that David slept with, the son that came from there, also, that same mistake worked out because the lineage of Jesus was through that same thing. So it doesn't matter where you've messed up. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. God can bring a message out of your mess. Amen? Amen. As I begin to wrap up, I want to challenge us today. Pride itself is dangerous. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. And the thing is, it's such an illusion that we might not be aware of it. God has called us to submit to him. I'm going to read a quote from a book called Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Well known. One of the greatest theologians and thinkers, Christian thinkers of the 20th century. And this book is about, it presents a perspective that devils have when it comes to tempting people. In other words, this was from one senior demon to a junior demon. So as we read this, have a perspective of demons having a conversation, one senior demon coaching another demon of how to get humans it says here the enemy they're talking about God wants him to be in a state he calls humility the state of self-forgetfulness when he would rather the human never thought about himself at all but we want the human to reflect on himself and to do so in a way which will lead to pride an excessive belief in one's own abilities um I think that's probably a mix there. That would lead to pride. Okay. Um, the key point there is we have a battle going on. There is a battle for our minds. There is a battle that the devil is trying to win. And the Bible says that we should not be, be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. We see these stories, but we can learn from them that we will not allow pride to check in. This is a call for us to submit ourselves fully to God. In James chapter 4, it says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. And it seems like the resisting is something separate. But the way to resist the devil is to submit fully to God. I call you today, if you've never had a relationship with Jesus Christ, this is the time. This is the time would invite you to give your life to Christ but I find it a bit uncomfortable saying that to give your life to Christ because I tell you outside of Christ there is no life to give there is no life to give I invite you to receive the life of Christ and if you're a Christian here today I invite us to search our hearts with the word with the spirit Search your hearts. Pray. Jesus said, The devil wants to sift you as wheat, Peter, but I have prayed for you. The devil wants to sift us as wheat. He said, I have prayed for you. Prayer is so important. This is why we must pray. Pray for ourselves, pray for people around us. Pray for our pastors. Pray for our elders. I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And at this point, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We give you praise for the privilege to be your children. 
Father, Lord, there is nothing we can boast of. Truly, we are saved by grace. And we acknowledge you in this place, in our hearts, in our lives. And Father, Lord, today, in any way that we need to repent, we repent of any form of sins or pride that we might have found ourselves in. And we choose to follow you and submit fully. Thank you, Father, for your unconditional love. We give you praise. For you are the center of our lives. In Jesus' name.